Welcome to the Find Your Voice, Change Your Life podcast with psychologist Dr. Doreen Downing. Listen in as Doreen interviews people who felt they didn't have a voice or who suffered extreme speaking anxiety. You'll hear stories about how they struggled to speak up, what they did to find their authentic voice, and the confidence they now feel to speak up and make an impact. If you want to get started right away to find your voice, download Doreen's free 7-Step Guide to Fearless Speaking at Doreen7Steps.com. And now, here is Doreen. Hi, this is Dr. Doreen Downing, and I'm host of the Find Your Voice, Change Your Life podcast. What I love about doing this podcast is that I get to interview fascinating people, people who have had journeys, life journeys, and challenges, and have come through those challenges. And because what I focus on here is finding your voice, finding your authentic voice, it's about people who usually have found themselves in other situations, and they realize that's not who they truly are, and they need to make a change. So the journey, the, the journey of transformation is what we get to listen to. And I want to welcome my new friend, Doug Brown. Hi, Doug. Hey, how are you, Doreen? Oh, I'm, I'm always excited about talking to you. You've always struck me as somebody so natural and easy and uh, probably not having had too much to, uh, challenge speaking in public. But um, let me read a little bit about you so people get a sense of what a what an amazing journey it's been to have you come to where you are oh, now. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. And uh, well, Doug, you are an executive coach and consultant who helps high performing CEOs, business owners, lawyers, and other professionals mac- maximize their business growth and leadership success. And this is the important part so they can have the freedom to live a fulfilled life. That is such an an intention to help others have a fulfilled life. Doug's story of finding his voice is tied to his career and life journey from the child of small business owners through being a lawyer and into his own journey into the corporate world and becoming an entrepreneur, business builder, and fixer. (laughs) And over the last 25 years, he's helped transform multiple seven and eight figure businesses from large corporations to family businesses, professional practices, not-for-profits, and professional associations. One more thing I want to say, but I have to, this is... That's a lot of life you've been living. <laughs> I'm older than I look. <laughs> I know that's I'm getting some gray now going on. So. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. I said, like, he looks so young to have done all this. Anyway, this, this last bit is um, you are a book yourself solify, solid. Let me say that again. He's a book yourself solid certified coach. Okay, I got it. Certified coach and his business insights have been featured in public in, uh, publications, featured in publications such as the Chicago Tribune, Inc. Magazine, the New York Post, and Wired.com. Well, uh, I hope I didn't botch your, your intro too much. I realized because, that they probably should have given you a third of that so we could talk more. So, <laughs> Well, I did, I did take out one paragraph. Okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> but well, I think we got the highlights. Got the and- idea. Yeah, yeah. What a generous human being and talented and multifaceted. But since today is about uh, your personal journey and what, what you feel were the early challenges. So let's, let's just talk about voice and let's see where you go about what was it like you finding your voice and what's been the journey? Yeah, well, you know, in preparation for today, and first, I'm so glad to be here and, and share, you know, my, my little story. Um, for me, there were two parts of public speaking because I've been doing it for a long time. And the first is getting the confidence to put yourself out there on stage in front of a group before a microphone, whether you're on a stage or not. Um, and the second is knowing what to say when you're there and kind of letting people um, behind the curtain about who you really are. And, you know, anybody who knows me will know I don't have any problem at all being behind a microphone or in front of a room. Um, I feel like it's always been that way. I mean, early on in high school, I got to 
the unique opportunity to do the Dale Carnegie program. Those of us who were older might remember that and uh, through a junior achievement in high school. And that really taught me the power, the confidence to get up in front of a room and speak and persuade and, and um, kind of led to a, you know, a bunch of things I did when I was growing up. And then later in life, um, whether I was doing training or ed continuing education programs for lawyers or my favorite job ever, which was being a PA announcer for the local high school, where I was the guy that did the, uh, the game environment, that was just a blast. So no problem behind a microphone, but there's the second part of it that was a bigger challenge for me. Um, and it's, it was always easy when I was doing the game or talking about like a how to manage your time or do that kind of thing. Um, but I knew I wanted to move to another level. I wanted to be able to really motivate and persuade people because I'd seen speakers um, like Doug Lip from the Disney, um, uh, Disney Institute. I'm like, I want to be as good as that person. So I went and got training on it. And that's when I saw the real power of persuasion is when you let people inside. Uh -huh. You said something us, just a second you ago, really you, you said something a second ago. First, we, you said something about being behind the microphone and that's just, hey, microphone is not scary to you. But you mm -hmm. also said something about being behind the curtain. And I had the sense that the curtain was something that you, a part of you was behind. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah. So when I went to move from doing tactical education things that that didn't really require letting people in and know who I was. I mean, I would show up, but it wasn't, I wasn't really embracing the power of story about who I am. And that was a big challenge for me when I went to go to this next level, because that's what really moves people is your story. And I didn't want to let people in in part because if I let people in, then you, I guess I could be judged. And then part of it was my indoctrination as a lawyer. And that was, if you, if that people see any sense of weakness or vulnerability, they'll take advantage of it. And, you know, whatever you say can and will be used against you kind of thing. And that was keeping, that was really keeping me from putting my true self out there to be able um, to speak. And then later in life, I recently discovered there's actually a link between these kinds of feelings and, you know, high functioning ADD, which is a superpower and a curse. So it's been on this discovery and I'm just, you know, all these years later, like it's not just what I've done, but how I've done it and what I had to overcome that makes it really interesting is there's a story behind it. And I never thought, you know, my own story was interesting. Well, it certainly fascinated me enough that I wanted you to come on and share it. And thank you. I, I think that already just this sense of you telling our listeners that there are ways in which we hide ourselves and there are reasons too. And I, because I'm a psychologist, I just want to dip briefly into early life. Just sometimes the pattern starts really, really young. I mean, you don't mm -hmm. have to like tear the whole whole history apart and, and go bare, but is there any connection in terms of the connecting the dots between what happened later? I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a, a good question I had. Um, you know, I think it was, I've always, you know, when my, I was very young, my, my parents worked for other people and then they went into their own various businesses and they always worked very hard and there was a never give up and just keep moving forward and just do, 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 which is how entrepreneurs get stuff done. There's really not a lot of time for, for self-reflection and it's a little bit of, well, you give the people what they want. You know, you've got a market, you go out and do what they want. And the story of what's going on in the background, that's, that's backstage stuff. That, that doesn't matter. All that matters is, you know, building the business and um, delivering the curriculum or teaching people how to do things without a lot of really self-reflection. It was only in the last 10 years or five years that I was going through this kind of midlife shift of 
oh my gosh, how did I get here? And what's next? And what difference does it make? I've got this long list of accomplishments, but yeah. there's there's got to be more. Mm -hmm. And when I started to even open up myself about what was missing in it was I wasn't, you know, um, really connecting with, from the heart with people, which is what I think most people really want. And the thing about public speaking, when I help my clients with it, is because they're coming from an intellectual place of here's what I know, I want to convey my knowledge. And that's not what connects with people. You know, it's about the story. It's about the heart first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, allowing myself to share that part of me um, was probably the most, has been the most difficult part of the journey. Because mm -hmm. well, I was putting the content first. Yes. And that seems really clear when you're talking about a curtain and a stage and mm -hmm. looking out at an audience and then behind the curtain is uh, so much more. And I, what I get a sense is whatever happened to you, that kind of slowly dawning that there was more than just looking out that you had to turn around and look behind the curtain. Well, I think, I think part of it, Doreen, was... I went a long time, many years, worried about taking care of everybody else. And it so wore me down that it, it was, I was kind of forced into a situation where I had to take care of myself. I had to get introspective and find out what was going on and not just worry about everybody else. Because if I didn't take care of myself, then I wasn't going to be good to anybody else. I'd worn myself so thin. Well, how, what was that? Uh... What was that? How, what was the thinning? How did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think it came when, you know, my, my business has always been about helping people and companies that are really difficult situations. So I just go in, you know, full, full speed ahead and do whatever it takes to try to fix the situation. But there's only so much energy that anybody has to give in the world before you have to replenish it. And I just, mm -hmm got myself to the place of pretty significant burnout where I was working harder and harder and getting less and less done and being less and less satisfied till, you know, I got to the place where I'm like this, whatever, somehow it dawned on me, whatever, with the help of people I surrounded myself with and my coaches that um, that path wasn't sustainable anymore, mm -hmm. that um, I was not going to let myself go through my 50s into my 60s without ever taking care of myself. I mean, it was just too much for other people. And I wanted to be, the reason I was doing all the work was for the family mm -hmm. and the community. Well, what a, it, it's like, luckily it wasn't like a heart attack and that was your wake up call. It's well, I started, I, mean, I think the physical manifestation was when I started having panic attacks. Well, hello, yes. <laughs> um, which was a real, like, I was taught, power through this stuff just you know buck up dude keep going <laughs> we'll rest when we're dead i'm like well yeah but i don't want to be dead <laughs> and i think that's part of the story that i want to get out and share with people especially men in their 50s but not just men that we're so busy trying to please everyone else and take care of everybody else that we somehow think taking care of ourselves is selfish and we don't see clearly how that we have more and better to give when we, I guess, are more mindful about things and we embrace our own story. Well, it certainly sounds like you have come to learn some really deep, wise, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because this whole image I have of you of being muscled and moving into situations with a lot of good energy but then that energy is like you said was it wasn't being replenished wow yeah trying to you know i think the key thing as i as i learned as this relates to finding your voice was me getting to a place where my voice and my work is really about helping others like i could kind of like yours kind of helping people find their voice, but not through how to be a speaker is just how to find yourself doing the work in a way that gives you more energy so that you can have a have that fulfilled life. 
as opposed to the model that perhaps our parents lived with where you just sacrifice everything and work until you're 65 and then you retire and hope that you have enough wealth and health to somehow begin enjoying life then. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I've kind of rejected that model. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And, and um, so I think when we're finding our, our voice, it's, you know, there's so many people I know who are stuck in a role or even a role they built for themselves, a company they built for themselves. Mm -hmm. And they wake up and say, well, is this it? You know, decisions I made 20 years ago, I'm smarter now, but I don't have any options. And the option, the my message is you absolutely do. Mm -hmm. You just have to allow yourself to, to explore a little bit. Yeah. And it's an inner exploration. It sounds like mm -hmm. mindfulness is one of those tools that we, we have developed that help us uh, navigate our emotions, navigate ourselves through difficulties. And I, uh, I think that that, that must've been something that you learned um, something about yeah. being aware. I was initially, um, I still remember that maybe it was a turning point when <clears throat> I was at one of those low points and my friend and coach had always suggested you try mindfulness. And, and I thought, well, what the heck? It's been around for thousands of years. Maybe there's something to it. And But I was a skeptic. I don't look at it from a, I never came at it from a spiritual point of view, I was like, I need a tool to manage stress and make myself better. And so I forced myself to be open to it. And then I realized how just important it is to be aware and intentional about what's going on in your head, about the stories we tell ourselves that hold ourselves back. I'm not good enough. I don't have transferable skills. I'm 50. I'm 40. I can't change my course. And all those things are wrong, but they're very powerful voices in our head. And sometimes all it takes is being aware of it to be able to work with it. Mm -hmm. And and even when, if you want to be a speaker, that, well, my story isn't very interesting to other people. Um, I guess unless you're a true narcissist, you there's all of us that believe that a little bit, like my, my mm -hmm. story is just my story. Mm -hmm. But that's what we want to hear from other people. We want to hear what their journey was so we can relate to it well yes in your journey about being somebody who was able to go into all these situations with probably very uh, intention already but it's a different intention now i think what you're saying you're helping people find i love those two words you had in the beginning freedom and fulfillment um yeah and there's sometimes the freedom comes from just appreciating where you are and what you do and the difference you get to make in the world. Yeah. Um, we get so busy doing all the time that we never stop to appreciate what we accomplished. And sometimes when I'm working with, you know, if I'm working with a, a lawyer client who's got a successful business and they're miserable, it, it's a, some of it is they just haven't learned the business skills they need. And some of it is they haven't just slowed down enough to really see what's going on. Yeah. They're so focused and it's an occupational hazard for lawyers. You're focused on what's not working as opposed to appreciating what you've been able to build. Yeah. I think that in my work as a psychologist, it was initially how I was trained was looking for the pain, you know, and, and why things aren't working. But now because of this whole new thrust in positive psychology, looking for what's working, looking for the best in people. And uh, so I understand what you just said about where you focus is also what you create. I think it for a big shift for me and hopefully for our listeners is that we, we I first went at it when I was trying to find my story, my formula, what makes, what makes me different. I would look out and say, well, there's lots of people who do what I do. What, what makes mine so special? And of course, people would say, well, it's how you go about it. Um, and it was really kind of embracing that and realizing that when I go out and tell my story of moving from all the different things that I've done, mm -hmm. um, there are some people who will look at that very negatively and not be interested at all. 
that doesn't matter. If I can reach a few people, the people who was really meant to connect with as a speaker, as a, as a coach, that's, that's the true measure. It's not about the, I, I look at it as the quality much more than the quantity. Mm-hmm. And that helps me get out there and not worry about being judged by somebody uh, saying something that somebody doesn't like, or it's like, you should have said it a different way. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 For people who are just listening and didn't get to see Doug, he just shrugged his shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, if they don't like it, they don't like it. But, you know, it's, it's so it's so important because if we go on stage, big or small, trying to please everyone, we won't please ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said earlier, too, about the whole point is connection. So mm-hmm. if wherever we are and we're engaging with people, whether on a stage or in a meeting or just a conversation in a hallway, it's the connection. And that, that's where I think a lot of um, people who are trying to be better at speaking um, can go wrong. And that is, if, yes, they're, they're, speaking is an art and a skill. And there are definitely, quote, performance things you need to do. But at the end of the day, that's all about creating a connection with the people you were meant to connect with in your audience. Yeah. And if you stop at the performance level, and getting people to say, well, that person's a good performer, you haven't completed the task because you don't want to be a good performer. You want to connect with somebody and have them say, that person said something, gave me something, unlocked some thought in my head that moved me forward in some way. Yeah. And that's not done by performances. That's transformation. That's mm. a trend. I, I call that transformational speaking. Mm-hmm. Speaking in a way that transforms your listener. Right, right. <laughs> One of the things that you said to me about speaking and, and voice showing up, it's not just about a stage, not just about being somebody who's uh, delivering a presentation mm-hmm. that every moment, I mean, even now you and I are speaking and right. in a way we're kind of public because we know that there are all these listeners out there. <laughs> Uh, so, so say more about uh, just your, your thought about life being the stage. Yeah. Um, you know, the skills that we use as speakers, understand your audience, understand your message, understand how your audience sees that message in the first place and what kind of outcome, what kind of difference do you want to make? You don't need to be on a stage or in front of a conference room or making a presentation to do that. Mm-hmm. When you're at a cocktail party, remember cocktail parties? We got to make, <laughs> and you got to go out and be with people. What, no matter what you're doing, you are making an impact on someone else. So how you show up, um, especially with an intention of connecting and being in service and listening, whether you're standing on your sideline of your kid's ball game, or you're at a cocktail party, or you're in just regular life situations, you're, isn't it better to think about being present than presenting? Oh, I just thought of that. That's good. I got to remember that one. Oh, I, I, I was. <laughs> Sometimes well, I just come up with stuff. That was a good one. <laughs> I know. Well, that's uh, you're on fire. I well, you, so. you said, uh, let's see, in service to, uh, to others, connecting mm-hmm. and listening. You put those three together and that feels like the if we had some kind of jewel the diamond the three (laughs) you know the three corners there listening Mm -hmm. connecting and serving Mm -hmm. that that feels like uh, the jewel of what i'm getting and that applies whether you're talking to a large audience or an audience of one and the the challenge these days is we are surrounded by negative and can't do messages and we're in such a hurry that rather than listening, we're automatically thinking about what we're going to say next. And that dead air is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but amongst all the speaking, there's not a lot of listening going on. And that's, that's what so many people want now. They just want to be heard, like actually heard. 
-hmm. And so when you're making a speech, how cool is it if you're the speaker, but then you're giving someone else the experience that they were heard? Yes. Yes. I call that listening to the listening when I teach people about mm -hmm. how to be in front of, well, usually it's a stage and an audience, mm -hmm. but even it's, it's not the anticipation or looking at them in a way that you're trying to figure out what they're thinking and you're focusing on their judgment, but it's mm -hmm. like, you're listening more deeply. And so when you, when you say, when we're talking about listening to the listening, uh, say a little bit more about that, because what I do is when I drop down into the listening to other people listening to me, I look for their goodness, I look for their heart. And I, I don't even see, even though they may be judging me, it's like, well, I'm shrugging my shoulders now too. <laughs> yeah. um you know, I, th I think that the listening starts well before you start speaking. If, if your audience is working on how to be a better public speaker, it's, it's before you ever show up. It's talking to the meeting organizer to find out what are the challenges that the people have? Where are they on your particular topic? I can't tell you how many times um, I've been in a, whether it's a boardroom or a, a, a lecture hall, and some big speaker will come in supposedly to drop knowledge on us and they'll lose us in the first 30 seconds because they didn't take the time to understand our group and where we were coming from and to to uh, and i've been in those audiences i've been in those rooms and what happens is the person on stage has no clue that they lost us and so rather than making a difference we're sitting here wondering she didn't even know that about us. Like she didn't do the, I'm thinking one speaker in particular that did this. Uh -huh. And you can't make an impact if you do that. Uh -huh. So you wanna, when you're crafting your message, you wanna be talking to people in the words that they use to describe their problem. Uh -huh. As one of my teachers said, you, you, want, you don't want your audience to nod their head and say, he's right. You want them to nod their head and say, that's right. That it's the idea and not the person. Mm -hmm. Well, just listening to you today, I feel like I could uh, keep on pulling out treasures, <laughs> some, some jewels, some gems, more and more. Darn it. So, uh, but I do want to, we're coming to an end and I want to make sure that you've said what you've wanted to say, number one. And number two, we need to, uh, look at how people can get a hold of you and make sure that there's some kind of, um, you know, easy way that people can find you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, th I think my, I mean, you, you pulled out the, the big nugget, you know, a few minutes ago. Um, I think the exploration of getting in touch with your own story and finding out how, and, and the power of that, um, is probably the most important part of speaking because that's the most important part of the message of connecting with your people. And that requires some introspective work, which I found the, the pivotal thing for me was having a coach to help me see what I didn't want to see, including the good stuff that I wouldn't give myself credit for. Having somebody that could teach me the craft of, of public speaking and, and the, the stage and then having a community of people who are on the journey with me, um, sharing their stories, um, creating a kind of a safe place for uh, all of us to be vulnerable and get in touch with the most powerful part of our messages. So it's not a soul, you know, the, maybe the, the big idea is public speaking is not a solo activity. You might be by yourself on stage, but it's, you need to have a team behind you, behind the curtain. And I, that's why I so appreciate what you're doing, you know, with your people. Well, the you just wrapped it up, didn't you? <laughs> the whole, we came well, back I, to the beginning you know, it's, on curtains. It's, it's not any different than the work that I do with uh, you know, lawyers and CEOs. It's a pretty lonely job. Mm -hmm. You don't know who you can, who's got an agenda and who you can trust and you want to make the right decisions and you want to be listening, but you got to, you know, there's all this. And that's why I went into my work as an executive coach, because I know how lonely it is to be in those positions and public speaking is part of it, but it's also, you know, being the very best person you can be, improving your personal performance, 
uh, resolving the conflicts that you just get so myopic on that you can't see other other things. And that's the work that I do and help people and, you know, run better businesses so they can grow. And then it's got some value and they do better work for their clients. Um, so if people wanted to reach out to me to learn more about that, I'm part of a group called Summit Success International. My email address will drop in the show notes. It's Doug at summit-success.com. And um, I also have something, if I can, for your for your listeners, it's one of the most popular downloads people ask for, um, because if you want to learn how to be a better speaker, then you've got to have time to work on yourself and get out of the day to day, get out of the weeds. And so the download I'll put give to you for the show notes is the seven, my seven steps to tame your to do list. It's a different way to organize all the things you have going on so you can focus on what's really important. Oh, and what's really important. Uh right now for me is having had this conversation with you and being in the moment, being real present and listening and opening up space so that you get to fill it with your wisdom. Thank you so much, Doug. I'm so grateful for the opportunity and I love the work you're out doing in the world. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today for this episode of Find Your Voice, Change Your Life. Each person during interviews shares what has helped them find their voice. You can learn from these guests and find your voice so you can be confident to speak up and speak out. And remember to download Doreen's free seven-step guide to fearless speaking at Doreen7steps.com. We hope you enjoyed the show and we'll return next time. Until then, goodbye for now.